During the pandemic, the Italian tenor Andrea Bocelli held a powerful solo concert in the empty Cathedral of Milan. This YouTube event, which he concluded with the moving performance of Amazing Grace in front of the deserted Piazza del Duomo, expressed through music a moment of refreshment and hope for the city, and ideally for the whole world. Today, I want to talk about another time when the city of Milan stopped. Another moment stamped in Italian collective memory, where pain and hope were equally condensed through music. It all happened on May 11, 1946, a few blocks away from the Duomo, when in the city's most famous opera house, La Scala, the conductor Arturo Toscanini inaugurated the theater's first season after World War II with a memorable concert. The theater had been heavily damaged during the Allied bombing of the city in August 1943 and had been rebuilt in record time. The conductor and international music legend Arturo Toscanini had come back to the theater where he started his career after 16 years of political exile. And the Milanese were packed into their restored theater and through radio connection in Piazza Duomo for an event that symbolically matched the famous announcement of the newspaper Il Popolo at the end of the war. L'Italia è libera, l'Italia risorgerà, Italy is free, Italy will rise, as the front page proclaimed a year earlier in the spring of 1945. Upon his return to the conductor's pit, the 79-year-old Toscanini clapped his hands twice, breaking his habitual rigor as a way to test the sound, then added, Ecco la scala, here is la scala before studying his most memorable concert. He had brought from America new strings for instruments, something that was impossible to find in war-torn Milan. And he had called back to the orchestra all the musicians who were previously ousted for political or racial reasons. His patriotic program focused on Italian composers, mainly Rossini, Verdi and Puccini, and revolved around opera, not only because the theater is the temple of lyrica, as Italians call melodrama, but also because opera is the quintessential Italian form. You might recall from the Italian innovator's lesson on the Baroque that the first opera ever, the Orpheus by Claudio Monteverdi, was performed in the nearby city of Mantua in 1607. The character of Orpheus, which was chosen then as a founding myth for the new genre of opera, can also offer us a powerful metaphor to understand Toscanini's concert, not just as a moment of rebirth for Italy, but rather as a universal message to the world. Orpheus is the poet singer, the passionate lover, and in a way the patron or the hero of melodrama itself. Through his lyre, which allows him to overlap lyrical poetry and singing ability, lyrica, he is able not only to revive the lost mix of poetry and music of ancient Greek theater, but also to face death itself, as he embarks on the attempt to rescue his dead wife Eurydice from the hands of Pluto in Hades. Through the beauty of his poetry and song, he reaches the bottom of hell and persuades Pluto to release Eurydice on the sole condition of not looking back at her while leaving Hades. Even though his song brought her back to life, warmth and beauty, nonetheless he could not resist the temptation of looking back and lost Eurydice forever. The myth of Orpheus thus is an identified opera with the ideal to bring Greek sung theatre back to life, but also with the challenge of staging a never-living theatre which could outlast and overcome the immobility and coldness of death. Toscanini's concert at La Scala responds to the same urge, to revitalize a destroyed nation, to restart after the drama of war, and to overcome the temptation of looking back. In this sense, I see this concert as the real beginning of Italy's reconstruction, what we will call later its economic miracle. Okay, Toscanini is one of the most celebrated musicians of the 19th and 20th centuries, 
music director of La Scala in Milan, of the New York Philharmonic, and of the NBC Symphony Orchestra. But why is he an innovator, you might ask? We'll discover in the next few minutes that Toscanini is not just a man who significantly reformed the art of conducting in concerts, but also the first who dared to connect opera theater to radio and TV and performance to recording and live broadcasting. His phenomenal career had an unexpected beginning. Born in Parma in 1867, near Busseto, the city of Giuseppe Verdi, he had studied cello at the local conservatory, and when he was only 19, he had joined the orchestra of a local opera company. On his first tour of South America in 1886, the company faced issues in Rio de Janeiro before the performance of Verdi's Aida, because of a strike that some singers had organized against the local director, uh, Leopoldo Miguez, due to his poor conducting ability. In searching for an alternative, the singers had proposed Toscanini as a last-minute replacement since he knew the whole opera by heart. So on June 25th, 1886, in Rio de Janeiro, a young Italian musician with no prior experience conducted a two-and-a-half-hour opera with the only aid of his phenomenal memory. His charisma and his conducting precision left an indelible impression on the audience, and that is how Toscanini ended up leading the following 18 performances of the tour. Upon his return to Italy, Toscanini continued to conduct. He would premiere Catalani's opera Edmea in 1886, and later Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci and Puccini's La Bohème. At the same time, he also continued to play in the orchestra as a cellist. In 1887, he actually played in the world premiere of Verdi's Otello, earning the esteem of Verdi, who was conducting, by virtue of his conducting insights. In 1898, he became the principal conductor of La Scala, where he remained until 1908. I invite you to go back to the episode that I dedicated to Ricordi and Caruso to understand the incredible creative moment of Milan's theater at the turn of the 20th century and the fruitful interaction of its performers, conductors, composers, impresarios, publishers, and advertisers. During his time at La Scala, Toscanini revolutionized performance by installing the first orchestral pit and the first lighting system, allowing the creation of a unified atmosphere through dimming. His growing fame as a conductor led him to accept the position as music director of the New York Metropolitan Opera House in 1908, a position that he will hold until 1915. The peak of his American success would be the premiere of Puccini's La Fanciulla del West on December 10, 1910, featuring Enrico Caruso as Dick Johnson. This opera, which many identify as the origin of the American musical, was an Italian reinvention of the American West by Puccini, who had attended the 1890 performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in Milan and recreated it in Italian for a US audience. Now, in 1915, at the outbreak of World War I, Toscanini decided to return to Italy. Strange case of history here. He was booked on the Lusitania liner, but as he finished the season early, he returned instead with the Duca d'Abruzzi. The Lusitania, as you know, would end up being sunk by Germans and being the case justifying American intervention in World War I two years later. So Toscanini is an impressive musician, able to innovate and bring to life a given repertoire. Toscanini, however, is also the innovator who first envisioned the combination of performance and industry, of music and sound recording. As in the operatic myth of Orpheus, who first dared to combine poetry and music, connecting performance and the recording industry might seem obvious to us, but only after someone did it. Toscanini invented the figure of the conductor as the person authoring and giving coherence to a theatrical performance. In the same years, in the context of silent cinema, directors also acquired relevance over other artists and started to be associated with the authorship of a movie. At the same time, 
However, Toscanini also invented the conductor as the producer of an idealized yet ubiquitous recorded performance. It all started in December 1920 when Toscanini brought the orchestra of La Scala to the United States and completed his first recordings for the Victor Talking Machine Company. These recordings not only legitimized the gramophone as a faithful tool for recording sound, dispelling the negative attitudes of many musicians, including Toscanini, toward the record industry, but it also legitimized the figure of the conductor as the creator of a unique, crystallized and perfect performance for the use of posterity. Thanks to Toscanini's work, recording moves from an industrial tool of distribution or preservation to an artistic means to achieve an ideal yet ever-living performance. Later on, Toscanini will continue to experiment this time in live broadcasting. His audacity in combining music, performance with TV made him a groundbreaking innovator. In the 1930s, during his American exile, and I will talk about it in a minute, Toscanini started working with the radio. He conducted the first broadcast concert with the NBC Symphony Orchestra on December 25, 1937. In the late 1940s, he started bringing theatrical performances to mass diffusion with telecast in simulcast with radio. And I invite you here to visit the website of the Arturo Toscanini Society label to get a sense of the quality of his performances and the depth of his legacy. As we saw from his work for the New York Philharmonic starting in the 1910s, from his collaboration with the NBC Symphony Orchestra starting in the 1930s, and from his work for American TV from the first telecast of 1948 until 1954, Toscanini had a very deep relationship to America. He would die in New York in 1957, even though he is now buried in the Monumental Cemetery of Milan. The most intense moment of creativity leading him from his first recordings to radio broadcasting, coincides with the period and drama of his exile from fascist Italy. Despite Toscanini's initial sympathy for Mussolini, after the fascist seized power in 1922, he made his disapproval of the Duce more and more public. And in 1931, he publicly refused to conduct the fascist hymn Giovinezza, at a, a celebration in Bologna for the composer Giuseppe Martucci, organized by the regime. This refusal and the subsequent attacks on his person, he was beaten by black shirts and placed under surveillance, led him to leave Italy and join other Italian expatriates in the US. Among them, I want to mention here the history professor Gaetano Salvemini, professor at Harvard, uh, the writer Giuseppe Borgese, professor at the University of Chicago, and the founder of the Christian Democracy Party, Father Luigi Sturzo, who lived in Gainesville, Florida. In December 1943, Toscanini made a 30-minute film for the U.S. Office of War Information, entitled Hymn of the Nations, a movie that featured him conducting the arrangement of the Italian, French, and British anthems that Verdi composed for the 1862 Universal Exposition in London. Toscanini had conducted the piece in 1915, before World War I, but he incorporated in this version the Star Spangled Banner and the Internationale, which was then removed from the footage. It is in light of this piece that we can understand the universal nature of Toscanini's 1946 concert at La Scala. It is also in light of one of his last performances in Italy, prior to his exile, that we can understand the power of his message to Italy and the world. I'm referring here to the 1926 premiere of Puccini's La Turandot, an opera that was left incomplete because of the composer's death. Toscanini conducted the opera until the point before its finale where Puccini had left off his work. Once there, he addressed the audience with the words, here death triumphed over art and left the opera pit as the lights went on and the audience sat in silence. At La Scala in 1946, death did not triumph. 
music did not succumb to the suit of war of Hades, as in the myth of Warfuse, but rather became the force that enabled life to revive. The rubble remains in the theater which was rebuilt on top of it, and the debris of the city's buildings destroyed by bombing was collected to make the artificial hill of Monte Stella, Star Mount, north of the city, as a perennial reminder of the tragedy of war. But despite the temptations to look back, life started again, filled with the memory of what had happened and the hope to start anew. That is the story of how Italy bounced back after the tragedy of World War II. Now, in the episode that I dedicated to Ennio Morricone, we talked about music as space. In this episode, with Toscanini, we talked instead about music as performance, that is, as a way to enact desires and display possibilities, to show the triumph of beauty over ruin, to perform and renew life together, without giving in to the temptation of turning back toward death, but always looking forward with hope and expectation. Entrepreneurship, if you think about it, is about this posture, to continuously move forward, to continuously turn a deposit of knowledge we have received from the past into a present event, without dwelling on what we have achieved. Whatever the situation, wherever we are, we can always start anew. There's always a chance to build and rebuild. That is probably the greatest legacy of a genius and innovator like Toscanini. Thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the Italian Innovators YouTube channel or join the newsletter at the webpage www.italianinnovators.com. You can also follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook or Instagram for additional materials about the show. Thanks again. Arrivederci e alla prossima.